Welcome back to the fourth episode of the Soul Audio Blog series on relationships, brought to you by the School of Unusual Life Learning, where we learn about how life moves and how people change. I am Jean Denny, the founder and director of Soul, bringing you a sampler of our curriculum on relationships that I hope is of service to you. In the first three parts of this series, I've been exploring basic ideas about relationships as energy and how they behave as living things and live in our bodies and how we start them. Last time we talked about some of the core preparations we have to do for a relationship and the attitudes and actions a new connection needs, starting with being rooted in the ground of our own being. But today, we're going to continue the process of actually growing a connection. There are things to notice. We can probably all acknowledge that what we do and don't do at the beginning of a relationship is important and even formative for how we may come to know each other. Ever had a relationship that didn't end so well after which you said, you know, that pattern was there all the time from the beginning. I just chose not to see it. Or I really wish I had done X instead of Y back then. When your nervous system encounters my nervous system, we start creating patterns. It's something like setting down the tracks for the future. They aren't rigid, but they suggest a lot at the beginning. Our relationships have to develop. And today I want to extend that idea of the relationships as a living system of energy and talk about growing that system up or raising it like you would maybe a child through different stages that are each important. And it may surprise you that this development strongly mirrors our own human development. This idea is a bit more than a metaphor because relational ties are literally nested in our body and sequenced in some way, just the same as our physical and neurological development. If you look carefully, you can see that relationships follow some of the same processes as our own growing psyche did. And this is the key to seeing how relationships connect so deeply to our bodies. Sequences of certain processes and giving things the time they need to develop, that turns out to be important for building a strong relationship. At least that's what I've seen as a therapist and as a human. And please know I'm not trying to say that there's a checklist you should follow or a 12 step process to relating. Each relationship, like each person, is very unique. The process of development might unfold in 10 minutes or 10 years. It's not about time. But if we want something that endures and is satisfying, I think we have to pay attention to how we really cultivate these things and allow them to unfold. For example, it might not be optimal to put lipstick on a baby, and it probably isn't optimal to be opportunistic at the very beginning of a connection either, to make crass assessments of wealth, beauty, or to size someone up for what need they're going to fill in your life. The beginning is a time to look at each other, receive, honor, and support. Or just as the gassed tomato that's been taken off the vine early isn't as satisfying as a tomato that's been ripened in its natural time, on the vine, our relationships benefit from natural timing. Maybe it's because we have so little guidance and so little help becoming adult. I notice that people often skip steps in relationship development with others, lunging too quickly towards some outcome they want, missing the present opportunity to care for what's there, to be tended, and that can set up difficulties. So in a way, last week we started with our relationship as a newborn baby. 
think of what we do with babies. We hold them to the heart, we feed them, we admire and gaze deeply into their eyes, reflecting our love. Each relationship we might want to grow has at least a moment like this in it, no matter how brief. And that's what I talked about last time, planting the seeds of connection and being the Sufi innkeeper. But what happens next? Do our relationships go through something similar to being, say, toddlers, children, even adolescents? And I'm going to say yes, they do, in a way. And maybe they even mature to becoming adult relationships that are marvelously creative, supportive, and fun, if we're lucky. So let's pick it up there today with the toddler phase of our relationship. We started it a little bit last week when we mentioned the idea of mirroring. And that's something important to do with toddlers who are just forming a self-concept, an idea of who they are. Sentences that include me or you, the I and the thou, reflect how we're being seen. And if the receiver feels that what they hear about themselves is accurate, it sets up the possibility of a heart connection and, for, and of trust. The toddler will try to grow toward what a caregiver sees in them, and hopefully it's a true reflection. And our relationships do something like that too. We may explore whether people will reliably respond to our subtle signals that we're available or our subtle invitations. How long does it take? Or are we ignored? Do they laugh when we joke? And all these signals are going back and forth in the development of a typical new relationship. And we could think of this as setting up the space for the relationship, so the stage. Think of how the toddler goes back and forth from mom's arms to the world, experimenting with space, listening to words about themselves and making their own new sentences. This sets up the rhythm of how we will exchange. So let's say that there's just enjoyment, delight with somebody you meet and you feel that pull toward them, knowing them better, and you feel that feeling of, wow, I like that person. You may not even know why, it doesn't matter. That not knowing is a stage. Good not to know, and just enter into the rhythm of enjoyable connection, finding out what you have in common, being playful, reflecting how they're impacting you. Think of that toddler's love. But at some point, that not knowing will start to feel a little odd, especially if you don't have prescribed social roles. Let's say you met on Match.com. We might look around for the right ground for connection, and maybe we could say the right role with each other. We often, as I've said earlier, start with a provisional role say we're co-workers. But if we want to go deeper with someone, we usually have to shed one role for another. Let's just take an example. I have a mailman that comes to my house every day. He's my postman. Now, if we were to start some process of relationship development, like I'm describing, where we exchange and laugh and talk and receive each other more deeply, he may become my friend. And that will require us to give up the purely formal roles we had to know each other deeper. But there'll be some point where it may become actually awkward. Does he think I'm flirting with him? Is he? Are we going to become friends? Hmm, maybe he can teach me car mechanics and I could help his kid with homework. That's a different contract and a different role. Roles can and do change over the course of a connection. That is part of their vitality. But there are these moments when we have to clarify them and stay in a single track. And there is a little dance as we try things out to find out 
who are we going to be with each other? Surrogate sisters and brothers? Friends that meet for support? Lovers? Are we going to play poker on Friday night? Maybe we should be business partners. So let's imagine that toddler now has grown up to the four or five year old that's playing at dress ups. And at that stage, a child is gaining a role of the family and trying on a role in their world, a firefighter, a princess. Well, you could think of the relationship as having this stage too. That's what I'm trying to say. And you can feel when it's time to make things a little more clear. And at some point you have to choose. Conscious or not, we need clarity to move forward into the next step. Because without a clear role, we don't know what the rules are or what we can count on. And to quote an old therapist of mine, the rules can be weird, but they need to be clear. And that allows us to deepen. And if that doesn't happen, it is unusual for people to just split off and disappear feeling uncomfortable. We watch each other, don't we? So many signals going back and forth. But let's say we manage to get through that stage of finding a right role with each other. A lot of fun and creativity can unfold in a relationship. Think of latency and the eight to 10 year old with their best friends, a time of play and industry and experimentation. Close friends. It's great, isn't it, when we can really play and explore? But there are questions in that stage too, questions of trust. Will the other person be there for you if you let them into your world more deeply? Will they have your back if you get in a pinch? Will they be your fighting partner if somebody picks on you? Or will they abandon you when things get tough? We test for that. And as we go deeper in connection, and our vulnerability increases, our vigilance may too. And we may need to make packs. I'm thinking of the secret codes I had with my best friend and how we picked, pricked our thumbs to be blood sisters. We needed safety with each other to go that far. And if we have that, we can have a lot of fun. But, uh-oh, what about Adolescence, the adolescence of a growing relationship. Well, that time of sexuality and rebellion and individuation, of risk-taking and explosive lower body energy, of forming identity. In the transition from the latency stage to this one, there's usually some kind of challenge or conflict that occurs. It could involve a breakup and a recommitment or a crisis in which you're tested together or a difference that you have. Something brings another call for clarity and information about whether we can count on each other. I think you can feel the buzz and the creativity of this part of relationship, shared projects, co-creation, enterprises, and if it's a sexual relationship, sexuality can certainly be a part of that um, or not. But gosh, so much theory here. What does this have to do with anyone's real life? Well, my years as an Upper West Side therapist in New York taught me a few things about the agony of trying to make long-term connections or to mate in a modern urban context the longing for long-term relationship, but the serial disappointment of that longing in one to three month relationships that had no context and that ended abruptly, often with heartbreak that took months or years to resolve. Mostly I saw that developmental steps were skipped and often the heart was not engaged in the early stages. The care taken about roles, the contracts, the protection of vulnerability were often dispensed with. And there was usually a rush into more intimacy than could really be sustained. In love relationships, the idea was to have sex early and just, you know, work the rest out later somehow. But somehow it was very difficult to work backward. 
with heart and consciousness, maybe not impossible, but usually it didn't happen. And most of my work was just saying, slow down, pay attention to your heart. Notice your body. What's it saying? Ask questions or talk more about yourself or talk less about yourself. Find out, test, let them know what you're feeling or thinking about them. Be frank. And find your own center over and over and over again. A more positive example maybe of how relationships can form was with a friend I have who was an Airbnb host. She hit it so off so well with one of her international guests who stayed with her on two business trips that each time he came, they laughed and they shared a lot of heart connection, but they had no thought at all of being involved with each other because they lived on different continents and he was in another relationship and they truly enjoyed each other, went out on the town a time or two, developed a friendship that endured after their official contract as guest and host had expired. Over time, they continued to text and Skype as friends. And later they started supporting each other through their various crises from afar. There was affection, but no overt talk about love. But over time, the exchanges were daily. And after many months, they finally admitted the depth of love and connection they had with each other. It took a long time. Eventually, my friend relocated across the pond to be with her love. And according to her, that distance had actually helped their relationship form in a healthy way with enough time. What I'm trying to say is there is a kind of movement of development in a relationship that corresponds with the movement rather head to toe of our own bodies in development. Our relationships unfold and become grounded in the world, just as our bodies do. And what is common to all kinds of relationship grounding, we could say, is a unique partnering and creation, which is something we'll take up next week when we will finally talk about the more matured relationship and how it breathes. We all want the pleasures of this mature fruit, but as we've been talking about in this week and last, it needs to be cultivated, just like that tomato vine or whatever other kind of fruit or vegetable our relationship will turn out to be. So friends, thanks for tuning in. I hope you can do it again or join us for a soul program sometime soon. There is still time to register for the, for the nature of being human, which begins May 14th. Registration ends May 1st. Or, or you can be a part of Pilgrim Soul where we take this relationship uh, work even deeper. You can find out more about the school at my website, jeandenny.com. That is J-E-A-N-N-E-D-E-N-N-E-Y. We welcome your responses to this blog series there and hope that you tune in again soon. Thanks.